Hello, this is Introduction to Anthropology 3700. This is a lecture on Homo erectus and the last lecture in our biological anthropology section. We are talking about the genus Homo and the species Erectus. Um, the dates for this fossil go from 2 million years ago to approximately 118,000 years ago. When we're talking about the characteristics of Homo erectus, what I would like you to remember is that Homo erectus had many attributes that we would consider fully human. If we saw a Homo erectus dressed in modern clothing on the subway or other area of New York City, we would probably not notice them at all. Um, they were fully bipedal, they had a human body, they also had a big brain. Early on in the Homo erectus period, about 2 million years ago, their brain size was 750 cubic centimeter, but very quickly it developed into a larger brain. Many modern humans have a brain size of 1250 cubic centimeters, so they had a large brain. They also had a low and thick skull with some forehead and large brow ridges. When I'm discussing Homo erectus, I again want to have you remember previous lecture on human evolution. There are many species of Homo. Uh, I am focusing on Homo erectus because I think it has the most significant characteristics and also shows some of the major um, advances in human evolution. Uh, remember there are earlier Homo uh, species. Homo habilis evolved right after the Australopithecines, and this includes Homo rudolfensa. For the Homo erectus, I'm kind of being what we call a lumper. I'm including other species. That includes Homo ergaster and a later species called Homo heidelbergensis. Um, but what I want you to remember is the skeletal advances, also the cultural advances, and the changes in brain size of Homo erectus. Okay, let's look at the skull. Look at this forehead up here. Also look at the big eyebrow ridges. Homo erectus had a big brain. They still have a rather robust face, okay, larger teeth and jaws than we do, but part of that was because they ate wild foods that were harder to chew and their life was harder. Okay, Homo erectus evolved first in Africa and spread into Asia, the Middle East, and Southern Europe. Here we have a map. This is significant. Remember, all of the Australopithecines evolved in Africa, but they never left the continent of Africa. With Homo erectus, we get movement into the Middle East, India, China, even northern China. And we have cultural evidence of Homo erectus in southern Europe. So a significant change in the environment and the territory that they live in. And this is uh, kind of re shows how smart they are. They have to learn how to live in these new environments. Okay, let's look at that larger brain, because a larger brain is going to change things dramatically for this um, ancestor. First of all, let's look at the price. What are some of the disadvantages of having a larger brain? The first is it creates a tight fit of large heads through the birth canal. Um, one of the adaptations we have is our babies are born with small brains, um, but their skull bones are not fused together. So they have the ability to kind of fold up to fit through the birth canal. What this results in is our babies are born with underdeveloped brains. They are completely helpless. 
they need to be held and fed. They have the ability to do very little for a long time. It requires long parental care and protection of the young, years and years of protection and parental care. The price of a larger brain is also the need for higher calories and nutrients. Our brain uses a significant amount of our calcium nutrients. We could eat the diet of a chimpanzee, but we would eventually starve to death. And that's because our brain would be taking the majority of the calories and nutrients from that food. So what we see with Homo erectus, they're using this larger brain to create a type of subsistence or a way of life that enables them to collect higher calories and nutrients from their food sources. Let's look at the advantages of a larger brain. Creative and abstract thought. So if you have plans for this weekend, you are thinking about this weekend in an abstract way. So you have abstract thought as well. It is a way to think ahead and make plans. Um, being creative, looking at a problem and looking for a new solution. Homo erectus with their large brain was able to do this. And this allowed them to enter new environments, find new food sources, hunt animals in new ways, and gain more calories and nutrients from their food. Um, you also see the development of culture. Culture is basically how humans adapt to the environment. I wear coats on cold days, that's culture. I practice a certain religion, that's culture. Um, I eat certain foods, that's culture. Humans adapt through culture. And Homo erectus had a large brain and had that ability. You also have more complex learning abilities. You can be flexible. Um, and by flexible, what I mean is humans can learn, but we can also unlearn things. Uh, for example, I had a dog one time who hated porcupines. So he attacked them whenever he saw them and he would get quills throughout his snout um, from the porcupine over and over again. I thought he would eventually learn, but he didn't. All he remembered was his hatred of the porcupine. Humans learn something and we perform an action and have a very bad result. We can decide to not do that activity. We have a flexible adaptation. We also can develop a deep understanding of the environment. When I was a kid growing up in Colorado, I spent a lot of time in the mountains and I started to understand animals in unique ways. I knew where the deer and the elk bedded down in the winter time. I knew the trails they took to drink water and where they went to graze in the evening. Um, that type of knowledge is central to being able to hunt animals efficiently and to collect foods in a complex environment. Okay, let's look at this big brain. This is kind of a side view. It shows you the big brain case, the development of some forehead, and then the big brow ridges. Okay, what Homo erectus did not have was human speech as we know it today. They had the brains for symbolic thought. This is a chimpanzee. Here's their brain and look at our brain. So much bigger, but also so much more complex. And the centers for language control in Homo erectus were highly developed. Um, what they did not have was the fine nerve endings for the mouth, the cheeks, the lips, and the tongue. So in modern humans, we have large nerve endings in the cervical vertebrae that allow these nerves to connect to these areas and give us the ability to have fine speech. Uh, Homo erectus did not have those large nerve endings. Also look at um, the larynx. Okay, chimpanzees, they can breathe and swallow at the same time. Um, and children um, can do this well, but as children grow, their larynx um, changes and we no longer have the ability to drink water and breathe at the same time. We have a much higher chance of choking than chimpanzees. 
but this ability to seal off our air passage allows us to control the air to produce speeds. Um, what Homoractus did have was the ability for symbolic thought. They also had the ability to make a variety of calls and gestures. So they could probably communicate a lot of information with their brain, um, their call system, and their gestures. Here we have an example of a fossil that was found from Africa. This young man died when he was about 17 years old. But what I want you to notice about him is that he was fully human um, in many, many ways. So let's look at those attributes. First of all, if we could see him in life, what we would see is that he had a neck and he had human shoulders. He was not a good tree climber. His body is designed for bipedal walking, but also for endurance running. He had a waistline that allowed for endurance running. He also had um, long limbs. And what these long limbs did is they gave his body a lot of surface area. So on a very hot day, he could expel heat from his skin. Um, many animals, if you've taken a dog for a walk on a hot summer day, you can see them panting. They do not have the ability to expel large amounts of heat from their body because their body is covered with a thick coat of fur. Um, we as humans ha don't have fur, we have skin and the skin allows us to expel heat and the environment so we can go outside and go for a walk, even if it's 100 degrees. Here's some reconstructions. As far as we know from the genetic evidence today, most humans at this time period had a darker skin tone. During the later part of the Homo erectus, we do believe they're developing variations in darkness of skin tone, but it's still a darker skin. And they still have the brown eye color. Um, but why I like to show this is I like to show these reconstructions to emphasize how human these individuals um, were. Another thing you might note is the loss of hair. Now, it's actually not a loss of hair. Chimpanzees have the same number of hairs that humans do, but our hair is much, much finer. Um, so it looks like we have less hair. What these individuals had was more sweat glands. So their skin has changed, but um, it's not in the numbers of hair, it's in the evolution and development of more sweat glands over their body to help in cooling so that Homo erectus could be active during the hottest part of the day. And we know this because we've studied the evolution of the three species of human hair lice. If you go back about two and a half million years ago to the uh, time before Homo erectus, what you will find is that human ancestors only had one type of hair lice. Um, as our hair becomes finer and finer though, what it does is it separates out the hair lice into different areas. We have one for the head, we have one for the body, and we have one for the genital areas. These populations become isolated and start developing um, differences between one another. That's how we know that during the time of Homo erectus, Homo erectus was developing finer hair because we start to see the evolution of these different hair lice. One of the reasons people believe that Homo erectus evolved finer hair and more sweat glands is that so they could prove, um, hunt by what we call endurance hunting. Now, it's a hot day out on the grasslands of Africa. Most animals in the afternoon are going to be sleeping under a tree trying to stay cool. The big predators are also going to be sleeping. Predators in Africa are most active in the early morning 
and the evening hours, as are most animals. Animals seek protection from the sun. But here we have this new biped, Homo erectus, that has less coarse hair, but also much more sweat glands and the ability to cool um, in a hot summer day. And a type of hunting that we have seen examples of in many societies is hunters literally running animals into heat exhaustion. And when the animal becomes overheated, it starts to walk in circles and eventually will fall to the ground exhausted and overheated. And we believe that Homo erectus could have killed the animal, um, a defenseless animal at this time. I should note with these spears though, Homo erectus had what I would call spears, but they were not this type of spears. They were not spears that you could throw any distance. They were very stocky spears with points that you had to walk up to the animal and stab them with. Um, so I call them thrusters instead of spears. Spears will not come for tens of thousands of years. So that's why it benefited Homo erectus to walk the animal into exhaustion so they could be defenseless because you could be hurt by the animal if you just tried to walk up with it um, and disable it. Um, uh, and we do have an ethnographic example. So this is a way that some people do hunt today. Um, Homo erectus was a, a runner. Okay, let's look at their cultural systems. What we see with Homo erectus is the development of more complex flake tools. One of them we're going to look at a picture is called an Acheulean hand axe, one of my favorite tools. But these flake tools have multiple cutting edges. Um, we also see Homo erectus develops a type of housing that is very simple. They dig a shallow pit and then they place branches in kind of a teepee shape around the rim of the pit, uh, pile on branches, grass, and soils to insulate it. And then you can crawl in there and the body heat of you and your family will keep you nice and warm throughout the night. There is also a possibility that Homo erectus was a developing a type of clothing, particularly those in cold areas. Not um, sewing per se, but possibly the processing of skins and other material to put over their shoulders during a cold night. This, these are examples of Acheulean hand axes, and these are quite big. They um, take up the entire palm of the hand. Now let's look at this tool, this entire edge right here would have been sharp and you could have used it to butcher an animal, to skin an animal, um, also to process different types of plant materials. The top of it could be used to crack open bones or different type of tubers so you can get at the soft foods inside. The bottom of it could be used for what we call a scraper and this scraper could clean out uh, gourds. It could also clean the skin of an animal, uh, the first step in processing it for leather. Um, these stones could be sharpened as well. We look at them today and we view them as quite primitive, but they were very, very effective. You could sharpen the edges continuously and butcher an animal in relatively small amounts of time. Okay, Homo erectus was also the first of our ancestors to develop fire. We think early on in um, their time period, they probably just found natural burning fires and were opportunistic about their use of it. But later on, we're pretty sure they got control of starting and controlling fire. Um, and fires have significant advantage in many ways. First of all, you can use it for protection. You can use it to scare off predators, um, keep you safe at night. You can also use it for warmth. Um, you can use it for light. People love to sit around fires talking and socializing. You can also use fires for hunting. 
And this is a little harder to explain, but if you had a herd of animals and you wanted to scare them into a trap, let's say, what you could do was start a fire um, away from where the trap is, and animals oftentimes, because they're so fearful of fire, will stampede away from the fire. And then you could set some sort of trap or um, run them off a cliff and have them for dinner. Um, Homo erectus also used fire to modify the environment. In some ways, it looks like Homo erectus started fires all over the world. Uh, one of the reasons for this, if you take a forest area or let's say a river area, it is oftentimes filled with brush and forest and very difficult for humans to walk through. If you burn down the brush and the trees, what's going to grow in that area will be grass and grasslands. And it will bring in the types of animals you like to eat, deer, elk, those kind of ungulates. Um, so Homo erectus looks like they modified the environment. If they had a predator that was trying to kill them, oftentimes they would find the sleeping area of the predator surrounded by a burning fire and try to burn it to death. Um, Homo erectus also started to cook food. Now you can make foods more nutritious and safer to eat by cooking, but also you make them easier to digest. So if you were to go into your refrigerator and pull out a potato, an uncooked potato, you could eat the potato, but your body cannot pull nutrients from it because your body doesn't have the ability to digest those nutrients. Most of it will be passed through your stomach and your intestines without absorbing any nutrients. If you cook the potato though, your body can absorb all of those nutrients easily. The same with meat. You can eat raw meat. It can be unsafe in the raw form, but more than that, it's hard for your body to digest raw meat. If you cook it, you can eat much more, but also your body can extract the nutrients much more quickly and easily. And this goes back again, this whole section to the larger brain. Homo erectus needs to come up with ways to increase their calories and their nutrients. And a big adaptation is fire, cooking the food to release more nutrients, but also using fire to hunt. Okay, what happened after Homo erectus? This is an area where many paleoanthropologists are studying. Um, I wanted to show you some of the species that come um, evolve after Homo erectus. We will talk about these in the archaeological section in a couple of weeks. One is archaic. Homo sapiens, the other is Homo sapien Neanderthal. And if you look, they all still have these heavy brow ridges. What we believe happened and what evidence we have so far for the evolution after Homo erectus is that Homo erectus evolved into modern humans only in Africa. We see the first Homo sapiens evolving in Africa. These Homo sapiens or modern humans spread through out the world, possibly overwhelming all other species of Homo. So the Homo erectus in Asia, for instance, would have greeted the newer Homo sapien populations, possibly interbred with them, but more and more Homo sapiens would be migrating to the area, eventually swamping the gene pool of Homo erectus. This is where current research is focused. People are trying to find the genes of ancient human populations and understand more clearly what happened to the non-homo sapien populations outside Africa once homo sapiens evolved. I just put this in so you could get a comparison again. We look at human skulls today and we have a very fragile looking face and skull. And part of that is due to the fact that we are Neolithic people who eat processed foods. So when you think of time periods over 20,000 years ago, I want you to think of people who had 
bigger faces and heavier bones because foods were harder to chew and life was harder. Here's an example of Homo erectus. And here's an example of Homo sapiens. I call them archaic humans. And again, you can see the big brow ridges, the strong faces, just like in Homo erectus populations. Here we have a comparison of two species of Homo sapiens. This is Homo sapiens archaic and Homo sapiens neanderthal. Again, life was hard. The foods were hard, so humans had a much heavier, bonier face. Well, I hope you enjoyed this lecture and good luck on your quiz.